and these Judahites, people from Judah, the southern kingdom, went in and did and, uh, some of the uh, issues they had to discuss. The first question I want to look at, or the thought I want to look at, is the idea of why did God use the bad guys? Habakkuk gets a little bit into this. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 12. Lord, aren't you ancient? My God, my Holy One. Kind of reminds me of the question we find in Scripture, especially in Psalms, how long, O Lord, right? Don't let us die. Lord, you put the Chaldeans here for judgment. Rock, you established him as a rebuke. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You're unable to look at disaster. Why would you look at the treacherous who keeps silent among the wicked, swallows one who is more righteous? You made the humans like the fish of the sea, like creeping things, no one to rule over them. The Chaldeans brings, uh, brings all of them up with a fish hook, drags them away with a net. He collects them in the fishing, his fishing net, and then he rejoices and celebrates. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net. He burns incense to his fishing nets. Because due to them, his, fat portion, uh, his portion grows fat. His food becomes luxurious. Luxurious, excuse me. He goes on, goes on. But the, the issue here is, is, Lord, you put the Chaldeans here for judgment. Why did you use the bad guys? Why did you? It's not us. We're your people. Why are you letting these people do this to us? Remember last time I mentioned one of the issues is for the, uh, the Israelites, or the Judahites, I should say, is... Uh, God lived in the temple. That was God's residence. God's going to protect us. Well, the city is destroyed, 586, 587. What does it say about God? This is his city. He, we are his people. Our city is destroyed. Some of us are taken, have been taken away. What does it say about God? Is he still God anymore? Some things I had to wrestle with. And also this issue of theodicy, the justness of God. Is, God, how do you let these bad guys do this to us? Where are you? Are you not sticking up for us? And the text wrestles with that. Uh, another issue, uh, I'm going to put this map up there, is lands and cities in Obadiah. Um, you see Edom there in the, the uh, corner to the uh, southeast of the Dead Sea there. One of the things we find in well, Psalms 137 we looked at already, and, and Obadiah mentioned this Edom, and one of the themes in the uh, Hebrew Bible when you look at the Second Temple literature is blame Edom. They're one of the groups that supposedly helped ransack Jerusalem. They were looking for opportunity. So Obadiah says, the vision of Obadiah, the Lord God proclaims concerning Edom, We have heard a message from the Lord. A messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us battle against her. So, casting blame on somebody else. That sounds like a modern American thing, doesn't it? Blame somebody else, right? <laughs> sounds like my kids. Oh, this brother's fault. <laughs> Moving on to Jeremiah. And this, this, this painting uh, from the Sistine Chapel of Michelangelo kind of encapsulates our perception, or a lot of people's perception of Michael, uh, excuse me, of Jeremiah as the weeping prophet. You ever heard that expression, the weeping prophet? Um, you know, some of that's due to association of lamentations with Jeremiah, some of that's due to the text of uh, Jeremiah itself. There's a few things that go on in, in Jeremiah that uh, we should take note of. One well, of the early parts, which by the way, uh, the Septuagint version of Jeremiah is shaped a little differently than the Hebrew Masoretic version. So it's something to think about. You probably, I think you've come across that in Drain, I believe. I think he mentions that. But um, good, a good study Bible or a good intro text or even commentary will mention that to you. But Jeremiah chapter 7, uh, Jeremiah's preaching in the temple. And one of the things going on here is, is uh, eventually what you find is that people try to make sense of why the exile happened, why Babylon come upon the Judahites. Um, and one of the issues we find is that they say, well, we weren't obedient to God. The Duramistic history, you know, uh, Kings, Samuel, Joshua, Judges, uh, some people think there was a redactor, editors, what have you, that uh, brought about this theme in the text or tried to mold the text to say the theme of we weren't obedient, that's why God punished us. Um, we, we, we uh, Josiah reformed things and we didn't keep up with it. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah received the Lord's word, a good prophet, right? He received the Lord's word. Stand near the gate of the Lord's temple and proclaim there this message. Listen to the Lord's word, all you of Judah, who enter these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord of heavenly forces, the God of Israel, says. Improve your conduct and your actions. Moral ethical thing, right? Ethical especially. I will dwell with you in this place. Don't trust in lies. This is the Lord's temple. The Lord's temple. The Lord's temple. Three times, right? 
degree duration. Three is one of those special numbers, like holy, holy, holy. Now, if you truly reform your ways and your actions, if you treat each other justly, sounds a little bit like Micah, doesn't it? If you stop ta uh, taking advantage of the immigrant, the orphan, or the widow, sounds a little bit like Amos, doesn't it? If you don't shed the blood of the innocent in this place, or go after other gods in your own ruin, remember we talked about the idols, people chasing after the idols, syncretism, inclusion of other gods, only then I, will I dwell with you in this place and in the land that I gave long ago to your ancestors for all time, and yet you trust in lies that will only hurt you. So this is before the destruction of the temple. Jeremiah's preaching there. He's saying, you know, you need to turn your ways, change your ways. Does it happen? No. <laughs> a good number of y'all have kids, right? And uh, I love my boys, but they're boys, right? If you don't straighten up, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get put time out. Most one especially is hard hit. I love him. He takes after me and his mom is definitely hard hit. Takes after you or your his both of us. Okay, all right. So you're putting eat. My wife may watch this. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jonah, stop doing that. Okay, Daddy. Next, you know, five minutes later, he's doing it again. Go time out. You know, we're kind of like that, aren't we? Disobedient children. Um, even though the prophets are there, their parents, you know, in, in, our case, in my case, are there to say, "Don't do this. Straighten up." We still do it, don't we? You know, it's a and I, I mentioned yes, uh, well, yesterday, but Tuesday, last time we met that uh, God has prophets today, you know, for, for me, I think of prophet, a modern prophet, I think of Martin Luther King Jr., maybe even like Gandhi in some ways, but I'm mainly Martin Luther King Jr. in the Christian context. Um, you know, he spoke up for God and his people. Quality. But, you know, my grandfather up until his death did not like Dr. King, spoke very badly of him because he didn't want to listen to the truth. Hmm. Right? Just to advance here. Another uh, thing that pops up in the text of Jeremiah over in 27, um, and this is the heading from the CEB, uh, submit to the king of Babylon and live. Submit to the bad guy. Uh, Jeremiah 27, early in the rule, rule of King uh, Zedekiah, Josiah's son. Okay. After, Zedek, after Josiah, things kind of go downhill, right? So what the Lord said to me, this is one of the symbolic acts, make a yoke of straps and bars and wear it on your neck. Like an ox wears a yoke. Then send word to the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon, to the representatives who have come to Jerusalem to uh, Judah's king Zedekiah. Tell them to say to their masters, Lord of heavenly forces, Lord of hosts, in those translations. The God of Israel proclaims, say this to your masters, by my great power and outstretched arm, I have made the earth and the people and the animals that are on it. I can give it to anyone I please. Now I hand, all, uh, hand all, over all of the countries to my uh, servant, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Now, hold a whole second. God's speaking here, and he calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant? Whoa. Could you imagine some uh, person who you think is uh, an evil person? <laughs> maybe some godless uh, Richard Dawkins maybe being called God's servant? Whoa. Doesn't sound right, does it? Um, imagine uh, some you know, bloody butcher, such as maybe uh, Stalin, we call God's servant. Just, God has his ways, doesn't he? God accomplishes things the way he accomplishes things. They work out for the best. I even give him the wild animals as subjects. All the nations will serve him, his son and grandson, until the time of his uh, land arrives there. Then many nations and great kings will conquer him. So his time's brief, right? As for the nation or country that won't serve Babylon's king Nebuchadnezzar and won't put its neck under the, his yoke, I will punish it with sword, famine, and disease until I have destroyed it by his hand, declares the Lord. As for you, don't listen to your prophets, diviners, and dreamers, mediums, or your sorcerers who say to you, don't serve the king of Babylon. And the last time we talked about this issue of listening to, or the prophet speaking the word of God versus what people want to hear, the Vox Populi. And you find uh, throughout the text of the Bible these false prophets that pop up, um, you know, uh, that speak what the people want to hear. So 
They don't speak for God. This is one of those things that Jeremiah has to warn against. Don't listen to these people. Later on, we'll talk about, uh, uh, again, it pops up. When, uh, Jer uh, Jeremiah tells people to settle down in Babylon, you know, buy houses. He says, don't listen to those prophets. They're not right. Must the court, what is a test, of course, of a true prophet? Is see what happens, what they say comes true? So you, gotta have, you have to have faith initially when the prophet says that he's speaking for God. It's kind of, it's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? They're lying to you. Their lives will lead to banishment in your land. I will drive you out, and you will perish. But any nation that puts its necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serves him, I will let stay in this land till, uh, to till it and live on it, declares the Lord. Uh, Pam Scalise, uh, Houston Teacher Southern Seminary, points out a few things about this text. She asks the question, this is from the Biblical Commentary, by the way. How, uh, how can surrender be a mark of faithfulness? How can being, how about giving up to uh, Nebuchadnezzar be faithfulness? She points out four ways to answer this, this question. First, she says, the, the assignment of authority to Nebuchadnezzar is an exercise of the Creator's role, not an abdication. It's God's place to choose Nebuchadnezzar, not ours. Uh, to put it in other terms, kind of like uh, I had a theology professor in Miami Div work used to uh, say, you know, when I get to heaven or somebody there that I think shouldn't be there, it's God's call, not mine. God's still God, right? I was talking to one of my uh, Wesleyan friends the other day. It's like, you know, so I wish we had more God's sovereignty in our preaching sometimes. I'm like, well, yeah. yeah, I think we all do in some ways, but not too much, not to be a, not to put John Calvin to shame, right? Uh, second thing Scalise put, uh, puts in there, she mentions that submit to the king of Babylon is a historically conditioned command. It has a time, it's had a time in its place. Third thing she notes, the period of submission is also in limited duration. You know, verse, she cites verse 7. The king Nebuchadnezzar had his day. His people had their day. They fell too. She writes here, No eternal principle of the divine right of emperors is at work. It's God's call. No emperor is above God. And the fourth thing she points out, the greatest threat to God's people was not the loss of the independent statehood, but the decay of national and personal integrity of faith and service to the Lord. Let's read it one more time. The great threat to God's people was not the loss of independent statehood, but the decay of national and personal integrity of faith and service to the Lord. So the greatest loss was not the fact they lost their land, not the fact they lost their own statehood for the most part, but the big issue was, are we going to lose God or not? Are we going to lose who we are in God? It doesn't matter where you are today or who you are, whether you, you know, we talked about bankruptcy last time, whether you lose your home or not. Identity <coughs> is important. And Jim mentioned something to me after class uh, Tuesday, and I think it's really important for us in the modern context here in the United States to think about it. You want to share a little bit about that, Jim? Oh, yeah, we were talking about the effects of uh, exile, and I said uh, we have many examples in our own history here in, this, in our country. Uh, and I uh, mentioned the American Indians. Uh, we can see you know, how they've been regulated sides uh, of our societies, as well as the slave uh, slaves that came over. Uh, and, uh, and you can just see that it isn't something that doesn't uh, happen back then. It's still, uh, you can see the impact of, uh, of those, uh, that exile today. So, that's... Yeah, um, I grew up near you know, the eastern Mount of Cherokee, the reservation, you know, and, and I have, you know, have roots in my uh, genetic background there too, distant, not enough to get the casino money. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you find that there's a loss. Of, there was a loss of culture. Oh. It's been trying to. They're trying to, be, to regain that, at least in, in Cherokee. Um, there's uh, poverty is rampant. Uh, hopelessness is rampant. Um, you know, uh, issues like type two diabetes is horrible. Um, and a lot of it has to come from that dislocation, that dehumanizing loss of culture experience. They, they're in some ways living in exile. And I think another point I would like to make is that uh, you asked, you know, how does uh, submitting to Nebuchadnezzar display your faith? Well, you would have to really trust God to take care of you. Yes. You know, if you were to uh, say, okay, you know, I'm going into this foreign land um, where I don't know anybody or the way that they live there. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and surrender because I trust my God to take care of me. No matter where I'm at. Yeah. 
the old hymn says, I surrender all. You have to have faith. Uh, Kierkegaard talked about the existential leap of faith. In my mind, I first read it, read it in high school. Uh, Kierkegaard, a little bit of it. I got to thinking about what, from my mind, makes sense. If you ever seen the movie Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade, there's a scene where you know he's going through these tests and trials at the end, trying to get to the Holy Grail, and save his friends. You know, it's a movie. There's a part where he has to step out. Is it a movie? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it really happened. <laughs> But there's, there's this part where he steps out on this, uh, well, he's supposed to step across this little canyon, and he takes a leap of faith. He sticks his foot out, and he steps, and there's a little bridge. You can't see it, but there's a bridge. You know, we have to take that leap of faith time to stick that foot out and trust that God will catch us, and it's hard. And I can only imagine, I, my, like I said, I really can't wrap my head around some of this stuff going on. Um, I can only imagine what the, the Judah Heights would have felt. You're telling me, trust God. You know, this Nebuchadnezzar fellow is going to come in here, he's going to, you know, eventually destroys everything, you know, steals the, the vessels from the temple. Uh, but trust God. Yeah. Okay, could you talk about the difference between, you know, God's command through the prophet to settle in the land, to submit to the king, and then the things that Daniel and his friends navigated as far as, I mean, how did, who was telling them how far to go? Well, that's part of the issue. Uh, and I'm of the firm belief that there are different voices in the text. There's not just one voice on how to do things. Um, and there's different issues. We're going to get to Daniel here in a moment. And in fact, I got a slide, I don't know if you looked at it, entitled uh, Vegetarian Resistance. And it's kind of tongue in cheek thing. I'll explain it when we get to it. Uh, but there is an issue of how much do we give and how much do we enculturate ourselves? How much do we give in the syncretism? How much do we resist to keep our identity? And that's a big issue throughout a lot of the Second Temple period. Is you know how much do we give in? Especially with the Maccabeans. If you're familiar with Maccabeans, uh, uh, there was uh, during the Maccabean War there was you know forced circumcisions in some ways. You know we're going to keep our Jewishness. And there's some groups who are like, oh no, we'll become like the Greeks. That's cool. Like uh, practice a thing called epispasm. to try to it's kind of an undoing of the circumcision. And that's it's, uh, even today we Christians we wrestle with it. I don't think Jeremiah was, and we'll get to that side here in a moment, but I don't think he really is saying become part of the culture, but be in the culture. Be in this world, but not of the world. It's kind of a cliche Christian phrase. Um, but in some ways it's very true in that. Uh, you know, there's some people that uh, are a bit of retreatist, and, and, and Christians are retreatists in our world today. I mentioned you all last time that when I was a teenager, I, I broke all, you know, me and my cousins, that we broke all our secular music CDs, you know, my cousin had uh, like a Pantera CD or something of those metal bands. He destroyed it because he wanted us to Christian music, godly things. A little misguided. I think, you know, we wanted to live a life for God. I think that's the aim. And, and it's, you know, it's for me in my life, it's always negotiating. How much is too much? I was talking to Dr. Matlock after class. Tuesday, I was, he came back in here and I was sitting on the computer. I was looking at Facebook. How much is too much Facebook? How much has it become my God? after a while, of my addiction. So, yeah. The, can I kind of answer, I think, your question a little bit? I'm, I'm kind of dancing around in some ways. Okay. Okay, good. I told them I had sleep last night. <laughs> well, I never have sleep, but you know. Sometimes you have a little more than other times. Well, like. than others, yeah. <laughs> are you, I, maybe you're going to get to this, Scott. Are we going to mm -hmm. talk briefly about Jesus and his exile? And maybe you're not even going to get to that oh, in this can. lecture. We can. But we can. Uh, I didn't know if that was going to be a part of it. But, we can. But I don't want to jump ship. So let's uh. let's, let's, let's come back to that. Keep that thought. Uh, put a footnote in there. We'll come back to it. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, Jeremiah 29. Uh, the prophet sends a letter to those in Jerusalem. This is part of that idea of settling down here. Uh, and there's an issue with uh, Jeremiah and some of the prophets. Uh, there were, uh, there's correspondence back and forth. Remember, there's at least two exiles. There's one in 597, and there's you know, one in 586, 587 was the destruction. In that interim period, there's correspondence back and forth. Uh, and we'll look at Jer uh, excuse me, Ezekiel here in a moment, who was writing from Babylon, uh, from uh, Kabar. Jeremiah's writing from Judah. So, you know, Prophet Jeremiah sent a letter from Jerusalem to the few surviving elders among the exiles, the priests, the prophets, and all the people of Nith. Nebuchadnezzar had taken to Babylon from Jerusalem. He goes on to say, uh, verse 4, the, heavenly, the Lord of heavenly forces, the Lord uh, Sabaoth, 
the God of Israel proclaims to all the exiles, I have carried off from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, cultivate gardens and eat what they produce, get married and have children, and help your sons find wives and your daughters find husbands in order that they too may have children. Increase in number there so that you don't dwindle away. Promote the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because your future depends on its welfare. The Lord of heavenly forces, the God of Israel, proclaims, Don't let the prophets and diviners in the, your midst mislead you. Don't pay attention to your dreams. They are prophesying lies to, uh, to you in my name. I didn't send them, declares the Lord. The Lord proclaims, When Babylon seventy years are up, I will come and fulfill my gracious promise to you, to, to bring you back to this place. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. When you call me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. When you search for me, yes, search for me with all your heart, you will find me. I will be present with you, declares the Lord. I will end your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have scattered you with the aspirin, if you've heard that phrase. And I will bring you home after your long exile, declares the Lord. God hadn't left them. He's not going to leave them. Right? Um, I mean, he tells them to settle down. Notice, do the things that make human life possible. Houses, crops, children. Go on with your life. It's kind of like with Paul in 2 Thessalonians, right? Uh, you know, don't sit up on the rooftop waiting for Jesus to come back. You know, you got to live life. You know, the phrase that was used at J Jamestown comes from 2 Thessalonians. says, you know, those will not work will not eat. And you got to do something in the end before Jesus comes back. Uh, and Jeremiah is saying something to the effect of, you know, where God's saying through Jeremiah, you know, I'll get you back. You're still mine. You'll, you'll, there, there'll be an opportunity to come back. But until then, you got to live your life. You ever heard the Oh, go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's neat when we're reading that in this context, and that scripture is used a lot. Mm -hmm. Use the scripture a lot. Pull it out of context, which I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> but when you look at it in terms of the culture and settling down in Babylon, and the Lord saying, "Only be with you, even though you're not going to feel it, and you're going to be in the culture, I'll be right there with you." And I've never, I don't know, just looking at this, you know, when we read it um, in context so much that it's about being the culture, feeling lost in it, not sure, and the Lord being right there with you in the culture of Babylon. So seeing it from the lens of an exile, and maybe keeping it in context this time, um, mm -hmm. just brought a depth to it oh, yeah. that I hadn't really seen before. People just yeah. pull it out and put it on their cards. And, oh, yeah. But it's so mm -hmm. neat that he is like, make gardens, settle down, and I'm right here with you as you move and flow and these people that are in the mm -hmm. I don't know, it just, uh, just brought a layer of it <laughs> to me that meant yeah. more than just seeing it like you do often. Context helps though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other thoughts on this before I move to the next slide? I, I was just going to say real quickly, yeah. the, the translation the, uh, in verse 11, uh, they are plans for peace, that's the Hebrew word shalom, mm -hmm. and the NRC has welfare, and I think that's a so we need to remember that, kind of like we were talking about this morning in devotional, it's not the absence of violence that God is promising us. It's not. We think of peace, we think, well, that's the absence of violence. That's not what God's promising us. He's promised us welfare, wholeness in the midst of turmoil. And that's what I think these oh. Babylonians are, are going through. So well, it's a bad, it's a, in English kind of fails us with that word, it I does, think. It does. It fails like the Hebrew word hesed. Yeah, I love that. I was reading the... Uh, like to the vein as if I use the phrase loving kindness, but you know that's only a part of it. It's only a bit of it. But this you know, passage you talked about the, uh, the the welfare, you know, and Sarah mentions taking something out of context. You know, the Philippians chapter four. You know, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. It's amazing what you're doing to read that in context. Paul saying, you know, I know what it's like to be in the lows, I know what's being like in the highs. You know, he he was stoned for crying out loud. Um, but you know, I can do things through God and get through the bad times with God. I can suffer through the being stoned for God. I can I can be on cloud nine, you know, and, and converting a lady down by a river. You know, I can do that. 
the grass to strengthen me. God carries me through. Okay. Uh, next slide, uh, Jeremiah 32. Um, in the midst of the siege of Babylon, Jeremiah buys a field. I won't say a whole lot about this so we can move on because we're going to get a little bogged down, which is a good thing. It's a good thing. Um, there's some things that Pam Scalise points out about this and, uh, uh, is that there's a responsibility of family membership. There's a promise that God's people will be restored to the land of their lives. See, what is it? God tells Jeremiah to go out and buy a field. Like I said, this is in the midst of the siege of Jerusalem. Jeremiah's told to go out and buy a piece of land. You know, if some invading army was surrounding Wilmore, and, you know, and I got a voice, you know, from above saying, go buy a piece of land, you know, in the midst of Wilmore, I'd be like, uh, no, this invading army might take it away from me, you know, or this invading army may take me away. Why? But it's God's symbolic act here for noting that the responsibility is being part of a family because Jeremiah buys it from a cousin. And also the notion that God's people will be restored to the land. An idea of hope, right? keeping hope alive through symbolic action. Uh, Jeremiah is taken to Egypt, and I've got some maps here to back this up here in just a moment, but just for a uh, brief moment here. Following assassination of Gedaliah, the guy who was appointed by Babylonians after the last king was deposed uh, in exile to Achaia, uh, there was a flight of some people to Egypt. Um, this may be some of the genesis of the, there's a strong Alexandrian Jewish group uh, in, in uh, well, the fact, the group that probably spawned the Septuagint uh, had their roots in Alexandria. Uh, but the notice here around uh, verse 2 here, Azariah, uh, Hoshiah's son, and Rohanan, uh, uh, Kareah's son, and all the arrogant men said to Jeremiah, you're lying to us. The Lord our God didn't send you to tell us not to go to Egypt to live. You know, it's Baruch, Neriah's son, who put you up to this. Uh, so that we end up in the hands of the Babylonians who will either kill us or deport us to Babylon. Uh, these people are stubborn, they're hard headed. You know, the prophet previously has said, you know, listen to God, you know, follow God. And, and throughout most of the Bible up until this point, the people are told to follow God, listen to God. But just like the Israelites and judges, they keep getting that cycle of sin and going back to the sin. Don't listen to God. These people here don't listen to God. In fact, Gerald Cowan, one of my professors in the uh, World Book of Commentary, points out, says, the message of Jeremiah repeatedly rejects the call for a popular response from Yahweh to a people of God whose actions make a mockery of the relationship they believe to be intact. They make a mockery of God when I listen, but there is a group that has taken to uh, Egypt, and Jeremiah is part of that group. Uh, this is after uh, the fall of Jerusalem, and here's one little map showing a possible route they took. Um, here's another map showing the uh, trip in Egypt. And there's a group that settles in El uh near Answan, modern Answan, on the Nile. And there's a pretty strong colony there at one point. Uh, and that may have its roots in some of this group that went to, to Egypt. Uh, now to Ezekiel. And if you're one of those people who ever watches the History Channel, you probably come across like the ancient aliens. <laughs> I love watching those things because it's like, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of dumb sometimes. I watch these guys. I'm like, really? You get that out of the text? <laughs> but this is one of the most infamous visions of in Ezekiel chapter 1. This, this slide is uh, the, uh, uh, the creatures and this some sort of chariot thrown with wheels. And, but here's a date, some dates. One of the most uh, orderly as far as date type books we have is Ezekiel. Uh, and it has a pretty strict, uh, tight chronology. And this is a nice little chart from Logos Infographics, Logos Bible Software Program, uh, listing some different dates and, and passages, uh, and kind of give an outline of the book of Ezekiel. And I'll let you all look over it when you get a chance. But I put in there, aliens in the Bible or God's mobility. Okay. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read this whole story, but we have these winged creatures with eagles' faces, bulls' faces, lions' faces, and human faces. We have straight legs. Uh, they look like blazing coals, like torches, verse 13. Fire darted between them. They have different sets of wings. Then we have this uh, really weird throne. Uh, the rims were tall and terrifying, verse uh, 18. Um, we have uh, above the heads of the creatures a dome. It's like glittering eyes stretched over out over their heads, just below the dome, their outstretched wings touched each other. 
Verse 26, above the dome of their, over their heads, there appeared something like a lapis lazuli, a form of a throne. Above the form of the throne, there was a form that looked like a human being. And what looked like his waist, I saw something gleaming, uh, like gleaming amber, something like fire enclosing all around it. Below what looked like his waist, I saw something that appeared to be fire. Its brightness shone all around. Just as a rainbow lights up a cloud on a rainy day, so its brightness shone all around. This is how the Lord's glory appeared when I saw it. I fell on my face. I heard the sound of someone speaking. It goes on, goes on. It's a really weird description. And here's another little uh, artist depiction of it. And this is just kind of this, you know, this is a vision that Ezekiel is experiencing. Some sort of throne with wheels that go any direction. These creatures uh, are there around this throne. These these cherubim-like creatures. And it says in the throne, the wheels move wherever the Spirit wills them to move. Ezekiel chapter 1 is one of those passages that was written from uh, Kabar, part of Babylon. Ezekiel's in exile. One way to approach his story is aliens. These, these alien theorists, you know, talk about this. Oh, it's, a, it's an alien. There's these domes, there's these bright lights. More practically, more sanely, this probably has something to do with the idea that God can... God doesn't just reside in Jerusalem, that he's, he's able to go with his people to Babylon. That, the notion that the wheels move in any direction, whichever way the Spirit moves them. So God, isn't, God wasn't just bound in Jerusalem, in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. God's Spirit can go with us. So God's Spirit is with me, which by the way, this notion is kind of strange in some parts of the ancient Near East. Gods are normally bound with cities, or at least connected with cities. Uh, for me, you know, being somebody from... Originally from Iron Station, North Carolina, God's Spirit can be with me here in Kentucky. And that doesn't seem too odd to us today, does it? But for you know these ancient people, that may have been a little strange in some ways. Um, so that's one thing to, to note about this passage. Uh, Joseph Blankensop, the uh, older scholar who uh, teaches at Notre Dame, I believe, still, um, talks about this being some sort of theophany, which it is. It's got the the thunder, you got the, the flashing lights. It's reminiscent of the uh, the uh, the, ex, me, the Exodus when Moses and people are in Sinai. There's this, this fire and storm cloud that guides them. Uh, Moses is up on the mountain. There's this terrible, you know, uh, flashing, this brightness, this this uh, theophany event. Uh, and like it stops, says this priestly reinterpretation. This ancient thing should be read as a theological attempt to find a way to speak about. God that combines presence and transcendence. God's with us, and he's still God. Because part of this imagery of the fire and the flashing and the smoke is also imagery of judgment. Which, by the way, some of this imagery is also picked up. A lot of the imagery in Ezekiel is picked up in Revelation, too. So, intertextuality, if you will. Meanwhile, back at the temple... My next slide, Ezekiel chapter 8, we find that Ezekiel is taken up in this vision, uh, possibly a vision, back to Jerusalem while he's in exile. This is, this is before the destruction, 586-587. And, and I saw verse 7. He brought me to the court entrance. I looked, I looked and I saw a hole in the wall, and he said to me, Human one, the, uh, some translations say son of man, dig through the wall. So I dug through the wall, and I discovered a doorway. And he said to me, go in and see what wicked and detestable things they are doing in there. So I went in and I looked, and I saw every form of loathsome beasts and creeping things and all the idols of the house of Israel engraved on the walls all around. The 70 elders of the house of Israel were standing in front of them, and all of them were holding censers in their hands. Uh, Janazia, Shaphan's son, was standing right there with them. Instead of the incense cloud, uh, rose up. He said to me, Human one, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark? The dark. Every one of them in their rooms full of sculptured images. They say, the Lord doesn't see us. The Lord has abandoned the land. He said to me, you will see them performing even more detestable practices. He brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the temple where women were sitting there performing the Tammuz lament. Possibly a deity involved in death and in crime. Uh, yeah, this the, we're focusing on this a little bit. A few little phrases that stick out in these verses I read. Uh, there's 70 elders. One person here, Janazia, son of Shaphan. If it's a Shaphan from the Josiah story, he's probably not from a priestly class. 
at least the priests that were supposed to be there performing some of these works. Okay? And they say the Lord doesn't see us, the Lord has abandoned us. So what, are they, what type of worship are they participating in? The expression when the, the cat's away the mice will play. They're sculptured images. So there's sin here. They're, they're disobeying, God, disobeying God when they should know better, when they should listen. They probably should listen to Jeremiah, right? They're disobedient. So part of that disobedience does bring about some judgment. Let's kind of look at that right quick over in chapter 24. This is a rather graphic passage. Um, in the ninth year, the tenth day of the month, the Lord's word came to me. Human one, son of man, write down today's date because the king of Babylon has set up a camp at Jerusalem today. Compose a parable for the rebel's household and say to them, the Lord proclaims, put on the pot, set it on, fill it with water, add meat to it, every good piece. The shoulder and thigh, the meatiest bones, fill it up. Take the flock's best animal, arrange the wood beneath it, bring it to a boil and cook uh, its bones in it. The Lord proclaims, horror, you bloody city, you corroded pot, pot whose corrosion can't be removed. I think sin here, right? Empty it piece by piece. She is rejected because her blood is still with her. She didn't pour it out on the ground so it could be covered with dirt. She spread it on the bare rock in order to arouse wrath, to guarantee vengeance. I will spread her blood on a bare rock, never to be covered. So the Lord God proclaims, horror, you bloody city. I myself will add fuel to the fire. Pile on the wood, light the fire, cook the meat, season it well, let the bones be charred, let the pot stand empty on its coals until it's hot, that it's so hot that its copper blows, its impurities melt in it, its corrosion consumed. It's a worthless task. Even by fire, its great corrosion isn't removed. How your betrayals defile you. I cleansed you. You didn't come clean from your impurities. I won't be clean again. Until I've or excuse, you will be clean again until I've exhausted my anger against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. It's coming, and I'll do it. I won't relent or have any pity or compassion. Your punishments will fit your ways and your deeds. That's what the Lord God says. you got to pay. The sin is so pervasive, the sin is so corrupting, that they have to go through this, this, this boiling pot of, of judgment. God has to do this judgment act, Nebuchadnezzar, to purify the people. So there's two perspectives to look on this in some ways. Oh my, this, this exile, this judgment, it's horrible. It's God's punishment upon us. Another way to look at it is it's God's purifying of us to make us better people, stronger people. You know, uh, there's a quote, says, the price paid for living in light of, is that of gold in the crucible, ever melting, straining, striving to make pure. Even today, God allows things to happen in our life to try us. The strain is that, 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 you know, that burns off the impurities to make us better people. You know, uh, bad things happen. Death is a trying thing. You know, financial hardships, you know, it's an expression when it rains, it pours. You know, stress in life, you know, things like divorce, uh, all kinds of things in life, all kinds of curveballs come to life. But if we trust in God and follow God, turn to Him through this, we're better people, right? What do you think? I see a lot of heads nod. People must, must agree with me, right? Yeah, but Ezekiel is essentially saying that they have to go, the Jerusalem has to go through this. The people have to go through this, this uh, melting pot, this boiling pot. You know, God says, you know, it's a worthless task. Have to go through this, but there is hope for restoration. Over in chapter 37, uh, this is talking about uh, the ideal uh, reunified uh, Judah uh, and, and Israel. Um, Marvin Sweeney, one of the, he's a professor at Claremont uh, Graduate School out in California. Uh, I think Senator is actually a UM affiliate, I believe. Uh, but uh, <laughs> believe it or not, we don't. <laughs> Yeah. I don't want to claim that. I'm sorry. Never mind. I'm Go ahead. Honest. I can do it. I know you can. That's right. <laughs> uh, but his recent commentary in the Smith and Hellwes uh, reading of the Old Testament series, he uh, one of his big theses is that uh, both that Ezekiel was extremely influenced uh, by the, the reforms of Josiah, and one of the last things that Josiah, well, one of the things that Josiah did in the reforms of Second Kings uh, 22, 23, and 
Second Chronicles 34, 35, is the trying to, to go across the border into what had been Israel, uh, into uh, Bethel, and to try to bring some of that back into Judah's fold. Uh, so so he, he sees this story as being part of that. But use that hermeneutical lens as we look through this. Lord's word came to me. The human one, take a stick. Symbolic act, right? Write on it, belonging to Judah and to Israel's associated with him. Take another stick and write on it, stick of Ephraim, belonging to Joseph. Usually associated with Israel, right? The northern kingdom. And every one of the house of Israel associated with it. Join them to each other make, uh, to make you a single stick, so that you become one stick in your hand. Uh, your people, when your people ask, you won't tell us what these sticks mean to you. Say to them, the Lord God proclaims, I am Joseph's stick, which has been in Ephraim's hand, the tribes of Israel associated with him. I am putting it with Judah's stick. I am making them into a single stick, that they will be one stick in my hand. When two sticks that were written, uh, that, that you've written on are in your hand in their sight, speak to them. This is what the Lord God says. I take the Israelites from among the nations where they have gone, the diaspora, right? I will gather them from all around. I will bring them to the, their fertile land. I will make them into a single nation uh, on the land on Israel's highlands. There will be just one king for all of them. There will no longer be two nations. They will no longer be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with the idols or the worthless things uh, or with their, any of their rebellions. I will deliver them from all the places where they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them. And I'll stop there for a moment. Uh, well, it goes on in verse 25. say, my servant David will be their prince forever. So not only is Ezekiel saying that there's hope, there's hope for reunification, and there's hope for there being a king, in the line of David, the storied king, will be our ruler. Hope. Oh. So one of the prevalent themes throughout the prophets, especially in some of these exilic prophets, is this notion of hope. We see it in uh, uh, what's often called Deuteronomy of Isaiah, uh, the second half of Isaiah. Some believe it was written in an exilic and possibly post-exilic uh, perspective by some of Isaiah's uh, understudies, I guess you could say. Those following the Isaiah tradition. But there's the idea of the roads being made straight, land being made level, highways in the desert. There's a hope of renewal and restoration. You know, we as Christians have hope, don't we? This world is in our home. We're living in Babylon in some ways. This world's ways are not our ways. But we have hope of restoration. We have hope of a world where God is king, where Jesus is Lord. And our hope is a place where there'll be, in some ways, no more tears, no more crying. That's our hope. We live out of that hope, don't we? So moving on, we have uh, a notion of Isaiah's, excuse me, Ezekiel's temple here. Uh, there's the old temple. This is from Logos, the Anthrographics. Uh, there's a part of Ezekiel where he reimagines the temple, reimagines things, an idealization. Uh, chapters 40 and so on, and Ezekiel 44 have this kind of idealization. Uh, and I, I'll kind of gloss over this briefly. This is a, a Zadokite priestly concern for purity. Um, there's a big emphasis in Ezekiel, this, this kind of Zadokite, this priestly type notion of you know, purity. Um, there's a notion here that there will be no uh, Gentiles in, in, in the temple in certain places where they're not supposed to be. Uh, verse 9 here, foreigners who are spiritually and physically uncircumcised must not enter my sanctuary. It is all foreigners among the Israelites, but the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who went astray from me after idols, will bear their guilt. They'll keep charge of my sanctuary, and they'll oversee the temple gates. And essentially this idea of, kind of in some ways, of the notions in Leviticus of separation of cleanliness here. Uh, John Collins, who teaches at uh, Yale, has this quote from his uh, introduction to the Old Testament. Uh, in Ezekiel's view, failure to protect the sanctuary of the temple was a major cause of disaster that had fallen in Jerusalem. In the future, no foreigner, uncircumcised and hard in flesh, would enter the sanctuary. Levites and ordinary Israelites were restricted to the outer court. A sharp distinction is made between the Levites and Zedekiah priests. The purpose of these rules is to make clear the separation between the sacred and profane so as to preserve the set and special character of the holy. So holiness is set apartness. That's one of the things that Ezekiel, his, his background coming of a priestly family entails. Uh, another thing that Swinney talks about is this notion of Ezekiel was a prophet but he was supposed to have been a priest. The temple hadn't been taken in exile. The temple hadn't been destroyed. So in some ways, his 
the role as a prophet is both prophet and priest. Uh, and he has this idealized version of the temple. And you have another song. Babylon's fallen, by the way. And our Babylon will fall one day, too. Revelation tells us. 18.2. It's another reggae song. So give you a second here to take a break from me talking. <laughs> Okay, now you got to break me talking. Give me any cool music. I'm hit up right now. That song's about 15 years old. Uh, the Persian Empire. Eventually, the Babylonians fell. You had the Assyrians, a big empire on the block. The Egyptians, right? The Babylonians, the next big one, the Persians. The Zardos Mountains, uh, kind of uh, uh, east of what was Babylon. There's Susa. You see Susa up there. Uh, that's one of the, the main capitals there, one of the main cities there. Eventually, Cyrus comes along and, the, and, the, and he issues this edict saying, go back. Part of the edict of Cyrus is recorded in, in Ezra. And the people, some people are allowed to go back. Uh, here's another map showing a possible route there. Some little notes on there, dates. Um, in fact, Cyrus is called, uh, in Isaiah 45, Cyrus is called God's anointed, uh, literally Messiah. He's God's servant. God used Nebuchadnezzar. God also uses this pagan, king, another pagan king, Cyrus, to do his, accomplish his will. God can use anybody to accomplish his will, right? Even the rocks can cry out, right? So Cyrus is called a servant. Uh, but there's some issues, and as they go back, the, the, these exiles go back to the land. Of course, there are people who are already there. Uh, what do they do with them? There's struggles and, and trials with them. Uh, some, there's this kind of notion that they're not pure enough because they may have been married. Their religion may not be as pure. Uh, there may have been more of a uh, concentration or uh, reorganization or uh, purifying of the religion in, in Babylon. People who uh, were there, they uh, may have, uh, have a pure notion of who they are. But Haggai uh, talks about the, the, the temple. One of the issues is, is uh, they're not building the temple quick enough, building a new temple. Haggai, there's, in Haggai chapter 1, there's talk about uh, paneled houses in verse 4. It says, is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses while the house, God's temple, lies in ruins? So now this is what the Lord of heavenly forces say, says. Take your ways to heart. You have so much, but, little, but brought little. You eat, there's not enough to satisfy. You drink, but not enough to get drunk. There is clothing, but not enough to keep you warm. Anyone earning wages puts those wages into a bag with holes. This kind of plays off that the theology we see in Deuteronomy 28, and Deuteronomy 8, and uh, the Dermist history in some ways. Curses and blessings are part of covenant theology. If you're obedient, God blesses you. If you're not obedient, you know, God punishes you. That's only one of the voices in the Old Testament, of course. You know, Job, he's punished. No, he didn't really do anything wrong. But this kind of plays off that notion uh, you hadn't built the house. You hadn't done what God wants you to do. Some people, whether it be, you know, Zerubbabel, Joshua, these, these post-exile leaders, they may be living in mansions. But there's no temple. Get your button gear and start building. It, right? Zechariah, one of my favorite books, especially uh, some of the weirder passages and letters. Zechariah. This is a, a woodcut. Zechariah's exhorteth to repentance. Uh, and one of the issues in Zechariah, if I want to briefly touch on, is in chapter 3, it's the, uh, the leadership issue. Uh, there's just two figures that come to prominence. We really don't know who they are, where they went, what have you. But Zerubbabel, who was possibly in the line of David, and Joshua, a priestly figure. Um, but we have in this passage the uh, appearance of a figure that doesn't pop up by name or by this name a lot in the Old Testament, whether this is a name or a title. Verse 1 there, uh, where the little blue A is on the slide, Angel of the Lord, or have you know, Joshua appeared before the angel of the Lord, and Satan. In the footnote, I left that in there. It's the accuser, or Hebrew literally adversary, this, this uh, rebuttal testimony, saying the rightest figure, uh, Joshua. And this passage uh, mentions uh, Joshua being um, unclean here. He's dressed in filthy clothes. He's a priest. He stood before the angel, and the angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. See, I have taken away your guilt. Uh, and I will clothe you with festival apparel, and I'll, uh, I'll let them put a clean turban on your head, a clean turban on his head, and clothe with apparel. The angel was standing by. It goes on to mention you, the high priest, you and your colleagues who sit before me. 
For they are an omen of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant the branch. And a lot of scholarship questions said is possibly is um, who is a branch off of David, a sprout off of David. Um, but this is essentially a, uh, a passage where there is a purification of the priestly class. There's been some problems, there's been some uh, issues against the dirty clothes. Uh, maybe syncretism, maybe some of the issues we'll talk about in a minute with uh, Malachi where marriage was an issue. Um, there's ethical and ritual things going on here possibly, but there's this purification of this priest to let him function as he needs to. Uh, and the figures of Joshua and Zerubbabel do play prominent in some of this second temple literature. They pop up in Ezra and Nehemiah as well. But that's some of the issues in the second temple. Now, another issue that pops up, I'm trying to go on for the second time because we're about out of time, Malachi chapter 2, we have an issue of marriage. There is a debate over uh, divorce and mixed marriages. Um, you see, one of the issues is when they got back, these people, these exiles got back, there were people who were left there, people who had been left, after, you know, when Nebuchadnezzar came through. Um, they had possibly intermarried. They possibly had been people who had moved, been moved in. Uh, you know, the Assyrian policy when they took over the northern kingdom of Israel was to relocate people and to move other people into the land. Um, so Malachi, one of the issues of Malachi is dealing with this mixed marriages. Those who have been exiled, those who were cleaner, purer in their perspective, marrying those of the land, the, 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 the ladies of the land, uh, who may not have been religiously or ethnically as pure. So mixed marriage becomes an issue, and part of that ties into the notion that um, there's the... Uh, the, the issue of the gods, the, the, the impure religion that goes on here when there's a marriage going on. Um, and also the issue of divorce comes up, too, in this passage. So, um, Elizabeth Ochtemeyer, actually, yeah, Elizabeth Ochtemeyer in the Interpretation Commentary writes, First, some in the community have broken the spirit of Sinai covenant with the Lord by turning to the idol, idolatrous worship of their wives' heathen gods. She you notes know, verses 10 through 12. And it also says that some have broken their marriage covenants by divorcing their wives of many years. It's 13 through 16. But some of the issues going on in a post-exilic setting. But now we finally get to Daniel and spend a few minutes talking about Daniel. And I put up here resistance vegetarian style because I have some friends who are vegetarians. And they cite Daniel chapter 1. And I'm, I'm like, no, not necessarily. Not even necessarily possible vegetarians, but that's yeah, whatever your convictions are. But this is one of those infamous stories. There's several of these infamous stories in Daniel. There's the, the, uh, the statue they have to bow down to. Wasn't I'm trying to think of the VeggieTales version. It's like a big chocolate bunny or something in VeggieTales, something like that. Um, Ooh, I love the bunny. Yes, it's the bunny. <laughs> Sorry. You can tell us about kids, right? <laughs> <laughs> but this story is the one where you know, Daniel, he and his buddies are the best and the brightest, right? These are the exiles. They're in Babylon. They're in the king's court. And they're given this food from the king's table. This meat has probably been sacrificed to idols or blessed by these pagan priests. Ritually impure or a good Judahite, a good, a good Israel, you know, Israelite, or, uh, or become Jewish people. Um, so Daniel says, put, we'll, put this, we'll do a test. He has vegetables and water. I think King James calls it pulse, doesn't it? We have X number of days, 10 days. And uh, if we're not looking better and healthier than all the rest of them, you know, okay. You know, do this what you will. But after those 10 days, they look better because they do, it's an issue of culture. Do we eat this meat, sacrifice these idols, break our religious rules, our identity, or do we stick to who we are, function within the system, although be a little differently, and God rewards them? Right? They, get, they have wisdom. Eventually, these people get high positions. You know, Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel doesn't give in. He prays. He's thrown into the lion's den. God rewards him. You know, they don't bow down to this this, this statue, this chocolate bunny, or this bunny. They're rewarded, right? God rescues the, 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 the three guys in the fire. And there's one in the midst of them uh, likened to a god, right? Uh, let's debate about that. But there's this, I, I like to call Daniel, at least the first part of Daniel, somebody's resistance to literature. Uh, in some ways, they're resisting against the culture. They're functioning within it, but they're resisting it. They're st sticking to their identity. And one of the issues in, in the Second Temple period, whether it be in you know in Persian setting, a Babylonian setting, or even later in a Greek setting after after uh, Alexander took over and his generals 
sorry, there were more kingdoms. Uh, there was issue of becoming more Hellenized. Talk about the epispasm and you know, things like that. Uh, there was an issue as how much do we stick to our Jewish identity and how much do we give into the culture. And that, that idea is prominent for us today. It's, it's in play for us today. You know, how much do we be of the world? And how much are we to be like God and in the world? Uh, do we be, become retreatists? Do we become Amish? Right? Don't speak to the English. Or do we go out and, and proclaim on the sidewalks and sideways, God loves you, uh, no matter what you look like, no matter who you are? Uh, or do we go out with a Bible and beat and saying, you're all going to hell if you don't dress the way I dress or you don't listen to the music I listen to? So what, do you, what do you think? I'll put you all to sleep, didn't I? You should listen to more music, huh? Maybe we can come back to Sarah's question now. Yeah, yeah. Sarah, what was your question again? Uh, About Daniel? Yeah, I just didn't know what other prophets were. I should probably read Jeremiah more thoroughly, but <laughs> how, how the distinctions were made between being investing in the culture of the city, being present, and yet different, how those things were. I mean, it's all. <clears throat> Talking about today with Weavers in culture, above culture, outside transforming it, you know, whatever. But, and I do think it's a mix of a number of things. I just didn't know what other prophets were speaking to the distinctions. Daniel talks a bit about it. Somebody's, but there's no lines or lists for us to stay, are there? There's not. And it's it's between us and God and the Spirit speaking to us, isn't it? Prediction. Uh, you know, is that old the black and white debate, and you know, Dr. Arnold recently published that book through Seedbed, kind of reacting to Adam Hamilton, you know, black and white, gray, you know, some things, you know, we're, what things are black and white, what things are gray, and it's, it's, you know, we have scripture to guide us, we have the spirit to guide us, we have, you know, uh, conviction sometimes, but, you know, it's, there's some things where it's not very clear on, is it? It's good to have those scriptures, it's good, it's helpful to balance out Jeremiah's settle down and Daniel's resistance. I just appreciate that. No, but they're not necessarily in conflict. No, I mean, I don't think it's mutually exclusive, yeah. but I feel like they're complementary. They're complementary. They complement each other, yeah. They keep yeah. you asking the right questions. Okay, I'm here. Daniel's faithful. He was obedient, but then he was more obedient to God, and that required daily prayer. It required Wisdom. Uh, I like the. It says he was blessed with wisdom. He needed wisdom. He was given wisdom as we continue to be faithful. That continued to grow. I also think it underlines uh, that there's a cost involved in following and serving God. Um, you know, it's not. He warns us that you know we're going to be hated. We're going to want to you know look bad on you know, because we're following him. But there's always a cost associated with it. You know. Daniel was put into the client's den. You know, Jesus was um, on the cross. So I, I believe that uh, it helps underscore that there always is a, uh, but it's, you know, the, the price is not always worth it. But I think it underscores that always a cost that we're involved in following God and being true to Him. Uh, because the world is, is going to be the opposite of that. Dr. Matt, like you mentioned, Jesus' exile. Are you referring to the time in the desert, or what are you referring to when you say exile time in the garden? Well, I was just wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about Jesus being in exile, both the big exile uh, coming yeah. from God to earth, but also how he was able to, to live as a good Jew, but yet be critical of his own culture. And, and Anyway, it just, there's a lot of things we could talk about. I didn't know if oh, you yeah. wanted to address any of that. Well, I mean, so or the Exodus, too, is, yeah. is also there, too. Or, well, you know, going to, the, going to the synagogue, where do you preach a lot? Or not preach, preach sometimes in the synagogue. And he went to the Isaiah scroll. Talks about every jot and every tittle will be fulfilled. He was, he was good. He was a good Jew. But he was also, in some ways, countercultural. You know, the Gospel of Luke tends to emphasize the fact that he uh, reached out to the sinners. He you know, reached out to women, you know, in some ways second-class citizens. Uh, reached out to Gentiles, who were definitely you know, not kosher. <laughs> Many of them were not kosher, literally and metaphorically. Um, he was in the world, but not of the world. Um, he was a different voice. 
kind of get at your question a little bit, I think, some of it. He, you yeah. Know, yeah. Um, uh, he, you know, it's, I love the gospel because of those emphases. Um, and it's also throughout the other gospels. I mean, he ate, ate with sinners. You know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he, he was a tax collector. You know, they were employed by the Roman government in some ways. They probably got probably took more taxes than they were supposed to, so they were despised in that way. So Zacchaeus was lower than low. It could kind of put him on the hierarchy if he were Asbury. The hierarchy is going probably under the cafeteria food. I'm just kidding. I like, <laughs> I like cafeteria food. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Like, don't tell the cafeteria staff. I'm spit my food down. Don't tell them. Uh, but, you know, I mean, you get that notion that Jesus wasn't afraid to step out outside of the cultural bounds. And Paul was kind of revolutionary in some ways, too. Um, uh, you know, he went out to the Gentiles uh, in some ways was kind of condemned for some of his Gentile work. You know, the Jerusalem Council had some of that issue at stake. Um, so, again, where is that line of being in the world and not out of the world? The whole Tillich debate, like, or not Tillich, but the Niebuhr debate, like you mentioned. Um, that's something for us to figure out and, and to pray for and, and, and really to seek God's face on that. You know, some of my friends, you know, you know, being in the world, not of the world, means not cutting hair and wearing long skirts for female, not wearing jewelry. And for others, it means something totally different. So. All right. Well, thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. It's excellent. Um, uh, you can do it now. You can bring it back to the next class, whichever you want to do. Uh, it's up to you. But yeah, if you can get it to me by next class, that'd be fabulous. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great weekend. And, uh, please don't put your name on. These are to be anonymous. So if you put your name on that, I will find you. <laughs> Scott's quite vindictive, I hear. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you want to, before next class period, if you're in in uh, by the seminary, you're welcome to slide them under my door or slow them to me. Whatever's easiest for you, or you can bring them back to class on Tuesday. Whichever's easiest for you. Thank you so much. Though. Let's see. Let's see. Mr. Mind the I think what it is, I think I figured this out.